Welcome everybody. Uh, this is the our shooting the bull session of the UK beef webinar series. Um, we're glad everybody could join us tonight. Um, and how we kind of work this one is we're going to start off by giving you a few hot topic pieces of information. Kevin, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, I think we're going to start with you and you had some slides. And then um, we'll go around and give some of that. We've had some questions that were emailed in. We'll get to those. And then if you have some uh, information or a question that you would like answered or some discussion, you can put it in the chat if you would, and we'll get to those. If you want to stay anonymous, you can send it to me directly, or you can send it out to the group, and we'll get to those as, as we come along. Um, so to start us off with just uh, this roundtable discussion part, we'll start off with Kevin Laurent, uh, one of our specialists down at Princeton, and uh, he's going to tell you some about the PVAP program. All right. So what I want to talk about with PVAP, the preconditioned uh, version of PVAP, is we've had you know a good bit of activity this fall uh, with that program, and just to 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 remind everybody what that is. It is the uh, program that's funded by Ag Development Board funds to encourage folks to wean and precondition their calves. Now, we're aiming this at people who have never, never weaned and preconditioned before. And that's, that's who our target, um, target audience is. So uh, what we've had since this program started in 2019, again, we're aiming at folks who have never preconditioned calves before, trying to encourage them to get their feet wet with this deal with a little incentive money. Since it started in 2019, we've had 32 different sets of calves go through. Or, and so we've calculated 32 closeouts on those, those calves. That's a total of 757 calves from 26 producers. We allow folks to do this twice. They can do it once and get up to $1,000 in cost share or incentive, I should say, if they complete the program. And then on their second time, they can get up to $500 incentive payment. So the figures I'm going to show you today do not include these incentive payments, right? So this is what they actually uh, actually made on these calves after all expenses for feed vaccinations, you know, sales charges and whatnot. You can see the... Um, for overall, on those 32 closeouts, they've averaged $83.86 uh, per head. That has ranged from $24 to $158. Uh, and if you do the math there, if you do the, the total number, that's $63,000. Uh, I think what's interesting is on, in this past sales season, beginning with one person who sold fallborn calves back in July, all the way through a closeout I did today on a producer who sold February 2nd. Those 12 closeouts so far this year have averaged $97.21. And so that's that's in the that's right in the face of, of some pretty high feed costs too. Now I know feed costs, you know, we're inching up like a lot of things are in the last few weeks with everything going on. Uh, hopefully some of that won't be long lived, but value gain, the good thing is the value gain is there and so hopefully we can keep that those prices coming and and to counteract some of this feed cost i want to show you an example of the pvap closeout i changed obviously i changed the name here but this is the one i actually did today uh from a, a individual who sold at the guthrie cph sale uh february 1st had 51 calves he's the largest group we put through the deal this is the largest group of calves uh, he actually is a second timer. He did it last year with about 40 of his calves. And then he wanted to do better this year and he and he, he did quite good. So we value these calves at weaning, got to wait right at weaning. He fed them 67 days. Their value at weaning was $39,000. Their value when he sold them February 1st was 52,000. He spent $7,300. He netted $6,000 by holding those calves for 67 days. So, you know, for working a little extra for 67 days, that's pretty good payback. Uh, that was $118 per head. So, um, and, and so we, you know, that's, that just kind of shows you, you know, what, what, what can be accomplished here. Now, in addition to that, he's going to get his $500 incentive payment. It's his second year. So he gets 500 on that. Now he's out of the program. So he's, 
graduated, if you will. So I thought we would just quickly hit the last two slides here. I'd show you um, what folks who are doing, doing really well with this, who have done really well versus the ones who haven't. Uh, and, and, and I've got those highlighted in blue, the biggest differences here. So what I've got is the overall average here on this first line of all 32 closeouts. And then the ones who were above average, they averaged net per head $121. The ones who were below the average were $58. And what, what do we see? So the biggest thing is gain. The ones who, who did the best got the gain on the calves. Uh, they fed the calves right. They had the calves prepared right. They had them castrated as, 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 uh, as young calves and didn't castrate at weaning. They fed a balanced diet. Uh, they did all the things that checked all the boxes here. They had a good sale. Their weaning value was, you know, basically even their buy sell margin, if you want to call it that. They put 45 more pounds on. You can see the ones who experienced, you know, less than ideal returns. The calves didn't gain as well, and the calves sold at a negative discount, see, on as far as uh, the buy sell. And so that just kind of, just to wrap it up, I mean, what we've learned. Of last year, if it's going on the third year now, um, a couple of things we're finding. I'm finding that a trend is that we need to be thinking more like 16% protein concentrate when we're going to hand feed cattle, not 12, 13, 14%, right? Now, if you're going to buy a complete ration and put it through a self feeder, that changes the game. But if we're going to be hand feeding in that two to two and a half percent body weight, uh, you know, we need some extra protein to counteract probably average hay. Because more than likely is even though we're feeding our best hay, a lot of times we're feeding hay that's in that 10% range. We need to balance that protein against total diet protein needs to be in that 13, 14 range. And to get there, we're going to have to have a little more punch in our concentrate. The other thing is need to, need to feed them. I mean, the, these calves are gaining. That's the most efficient time in their lives. So feed them. You know, the 45-day thing is sort of going by the wayside. Um, most of our preconditioned programs are requiring 60 days. So if you're making money on a 60-day feed, you know, on your feeding program, feed them the 60 days. That's probably a good thing that they require in 60 days now. That's a good thing for our cow calf folks. Like I said, castrate early, deworm at weaning. Use good quality hay that first, at least that first week. If you've got access to some square hay, uh, some good, I mean, my ideal hay is second, second cutting orchard grass hay with no seed heads. I've never seen a calf not refuse, that ever refuse that kind of hay. Good, soft, leafy hay. Um, at least that first week of weaning, I think, makes a big difference. Uh, and be aware of the seasonality of our markets. Uh, our springborn calves, it, it, one thing we have seen a trend to, the ones who tried to wean and sell in November usually didn't do as well in this buy-sell um, uh, scenario comparison like I'm talking about because they didn't allow it seasonally. Our cattle market tends to trend upward when we get into that December through February period. So our springborn calves, if we can hold them a little bit later, you know, wean October, sell them at December, February uh, period. I think that that I think we get better odds in our in uh, on our in our favor that we're going to have a good selling outcome. Uh, Kenny Burda, I don't think he's going to be able to join us tonight. I think he would back that up. He's got data from years, several years that backs that that uh that that same scenario. Hold the the um, the advantage of holding these calves, you know, through the first of the year. On our fallborn calves, you know, I like to say that it's hard to mess up selling a fallborn calf. I mean, we can take advantage of that market in April and May coming off the cow when people are wanting grass calves if we hadn't got them to creep fed fat, right? Uh, and so we can we can we can jump ship then, you know, jump off the send them to town then in that that April May period. Or I like to take it encourage folks to wean and. Take advantage of some forage resources you might have that summer. Maybe grow them a little slower with a little less supplement and shoot for that July through September yearling market. Seasonally, historically, that is the high in the in the yearlings. This might be a year you want look, you may want to look at it. If you're sitting on fall calves, if you uh, you know, if these world politics still have us a little bit depressed going into the spring. 
you know, might not be a bad idea if you've got the forage resources, graze those cattle and maybe supplement a little more grain on grass and uh, maybe not feed quite as heavy as that two, two and a half percent and let those calves get to that seven, eight weight range for that, that July through September yearling market might not be a bad strategy. So that's all I've got there on uh, PVAP. If you've got, if anyone has any questions, obviously you can put them in the chat box. The other thing is uh, if you're interested, uh, if your producer is not ever weaned and preconditioned calves, you're a candidate for this program. Uh, if you're a county agent out there who knows you've got some producers that you'd like to try to get enrolled, we've got money for another year. So uh, I'd encourage you to, to, to jump on board and to see what we can what we can accomplish. All right, appreciate it, Kevin. Hey, do you want to either put your email in the chat box if somebody wants to get a hold of you or do they need to go through their county agent? Kind of how do you want to handle that? I mean, they can go through the county agent, but I don't mind. The, yeah, I'll put it in there. No problem. Okay. All right. If you have any additional questions, uh, just put it in the chat for Kevin. I'm going to uh, pop over to Dr. Lim Cooler next because he's kind of going to be popping in and out a little bit tonight. I think he's uh, got a he's got another commitment that he's kind of sharing with us. So, Dr. Lim Cooler, any any quick uh, pointers for folks? Hot topics. I uh, just realized that uh, there's a lot of market volatility right now. The um, Obviously, with the war issue that's going on, there's a lot of concern on what commodity prices are going to do. If we look back a month from uh, or, or look at oil prices a month back in February compared to where we're at now, you're looking at, you know, about $88 a barrel to where we're at $124, $125 a barrel. So fuel prices have drastically jumped up. Wheat prices have gone up. Uh, they hit almost $14 a bushel um, yesterday, but they were kind of limit down again today. So the point on this is there's going to be a lot of market volatility. So if, if you're buying stockers uh, or buying calves to background, you really need to talk uh, with your banker and or your broker and talk a little bit about risk management. Dr. Burdine is uh, going to be doing a backgrounding, uh, kind of a profitability for backgrounders uh, course that went out. And so be watching for it. But Certainly be taking the opportunity now to think about strategies to manage some of this financial risk with all the volatility that we have in the markets. Um, other than that, there's um, certainly some opportunities for us to take advantage of local feed. And uh, if you have access to some of our bourbon derived feedstuffs like distillers grains or stillage or slop, uh, syrup, those can be an opportunity for us to maybe lower our feed costs to take advantage of those local uh, feeds. So uh, we've got publications out there on stillage and distillers grains, but certainly reach out to us and, and we'll do the best we can. Uh, the other thing is just keep in the back of our minds that um, you don't want to pull everything away from these cattle. Um, if you begin limiting things like Kevin mentioned, uh, feeding too low of a protein to these backgrounding calves, not feeding enough to these backgrounding calves, you're going to wind up suffering in the long run. And it's the same way with our beef cows. Uh, we could see some implications where mineral prices are going to go up a little bit higher, but that doesn't mean we just want to switch over to white salt. Uh, we've had some cases, continue to have quite a few cases of copper and selenium deficiencies coming in the diagnostic lab. We had two cases of vitamin deficiencies come in this year. So um, don't, don't stop feeding a, a really good mineral. We, we need those going into the cattle um, to help prevent some of these deficiencies. With that there, I don't really have anything official to say other than just kind of manage the risk. All right, thank you, Jeff. Um, so, Moving on, and like I say, if you have any other nutrition kind of questions, uh, pop those in for Dr. Lim Cooler, and we have Dr. Valen on as well that uh, can handle those two. I'm going to move over now to Dr. Josh Jackson. We appreciate Josh joining us tonight. Uh, he's in our uh, Ag Engineering Department. And, and Josh, I'm going to see if you have any hot topics, and then we've already got a question for you. So we'll jump right into that, actually, uh, after your, if you have a hot topic for us. So a hot topic would be, you know, kind of similar to what everybody else is saying, we know supply chain issues are, are happening. So if you're looking at getting handling, handling equipment, fencing supplies, um, anything, 
anything you need for that fencing or handling animals, you need to go ahead and get it now, ideally. And if you're getting Kate money, potentially, go ahead and plan to make that purchase now if possible. Um, we're still seeing some shortages as far as posts are, posts concerned and wire. So that's, that's still an issue across the state trying to get uh, fencing supplies, materials needed to work animals. So be, be sure to be cognizant of that at your local, local dealership. They do have it in. I'm gonna say go ahead and plan to buy it if you're going to do that this year. Um, I guess for the question here, we had the new farmer just bought 32 acres on a, up a hill. Uh, pasture land, any ideas on the best fencing on a hill for cow calf operations? Uh, for this, you know, it, it really depends on how, how steep a hill you're talking about. Uh, if we're looking at exterior fencing, I'm a huge fan of, we, we go through the fencing school every year, Chris Teutsch uh, leads that project, but we can talk about in the fencing schools, uh, high tensile woven wire. So that, that seems to be very effective for a perimeter fence. And then on the interior of that, I'd almost suggest um, a, a strand of hot wire so that you could potentially create some divisions within that field. Uh, within that, you know, potentially what we could have, if you're doing your, your divisions, I'd almost test it for at least two years or a year or two, figure out what works as far as interior fencing. I might use a single strand or two strands of uh, uh, electric poly wire and some pigtail posts or something to help me figure out, you know, where do I want my fencing, what works best on this hillside. And then from there, I might make it permanent, make it permanent uh, being a five strand high tensile fence with post spacing every 30 foot or thereabouts, you know, depending on how bad your hills are. So uh, that would be my general recommendation. You, and you could do the exterior fencing, uh, could be, you know, five strand, high tensile, all hot. But, you know, if there isn't a, a storm event and you lose power, you know, that, would, that would be the responsibility would, would fall back on you. So I think you'd be more resilient if you had an exterior fence being a high tensile woven wire an interior fence and could be electric, hot, high tensile. Excellent. Thanks very much, Dr. Jackson. If anybody has any questions for Josh, just put them in the chat um, and uh, I'm sure he'll be happy to jump on them. Um, I'm gonna pop over next to Dr. Chris Toich, uh, since you just mentioned him, Josh. And uh, Chris is our forage guy out at Princeton and uh, been picking up debris out of the field still from the tornadoes today when I talked to him. So uh, Chris, appreciate you joining us tonight after all that fun you had today and uh, any hot topics for the folks. Well, th thanks dear for having me on tonight. Um, I, I guess the 800 pound gorilla in the room is fertilizer price. Uh, as most of you know, we've, we've almost tripled the fertilizer price over the last year and a half. So um, thinking about strategies for mitigating those increased prices and how we get through this, uh, these high fertilizer prices is um, kind of at the top of my list. We've got a really good video on our uh, KY Forges YouTube site. We've got one called 10 tips for weathering high fertilizer prices. And then at KCA this year, our forage session focused on uh, weathering the fertilizer prices. And there's three outstanding videos from that um, session on our, our uh, KY Forages YouTube channel. If you're interested in watching those, the best way to get there is just simply Google KY Forages YouTube, and it should be the first thing that comes up in the uh, search. So, um, be happy to answer any questions about that and uh, or any other questions you might have. Excellent. Sure appreciate it, Chris. All right, gonna move over to my good buddy, Dr. Les Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson is our repro guy. And so um, uh, Les, what, what hot topic do you have for us tonight? I mean, March is uh, one of our more interesting months for repro because we got Two different things going on. Um, first of all, for those spring calvers that are either just getting started or have been going for a week or two, just a couple of just quick pointers on calving. I mean, there's three stages really, but two that you got to pay pay close attention to. And uh, one is stage one, where the animal's just beginning to beginning the parchment process. You're going to see your sort off. You're going to see a little bit of mucus. Um, coming out of the vulva, 
You're going to see actual contractions and she's just going to be agitated, nervous, kind of weird, you know, and as she enters stage two, okay, she, you'll, you'll see some placenta uh, be expelled out the vulva. Uh, you know, we call that the water bag, of course, and she'll let, find a place isolated if she can. She'll lay down and she'll start, start a very active birthing process and Stage two is really what we consider active birthing. Uh, by the time you, from the time you see the water bag until you see feet, you need, you need to see progress. And so you're, you're seeing this series of pictures and it, uh, it, it's the same cow, it doesn't really look like it, but it's the same cow. Really, if you don't see some progress here in two hours, get, get the doggone thing out, okay? Um, just get your, get your, little chains, throw a little lasso around her if you need to, get her in the barn, wherever you're, wherever you're set up to handle your, your calving cows and get that doggone calf out of there if you can. Um, there's a ton of data that, that suggests if you want to get a rebred, you need to get that calf out of there. Um, of course, stage two ends with uh, the cow expelling the calf completely. Um, you want to make sure that the cow uh, gets that calf licked off. You want to get the placental membranes off of the nose okay you really don't want to pick it up and shake it and all that stuff like they used to you know when i was a kid that was one of the things we we wanted to do to try to get that going but they've really shown that that causes more damage than it does good you want to get the the calf to start breathing and try to make sure that its nostrils are clean just get you a little stick or a piece of straw or something clean those nostrils out again when you get to this process, if that cow, if it's been, if it's a cow and it's, she's been stuck here with feet out, okay, for two hours, um, go ahead and assist. If you happen to see her here and the feet are upside down, assist immediately. If you're not used to uh, a breech birth or, 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 you know, a backwards calf, then make sure you call your vet as soon as you can uh, so that we, you can get some assistance. Cut that time in half if it's if it's a heifer. So your first calf heifers, if she's laying down to have her first calf, really give her no leniency whatsoever. Get that calf out in 60 minutes, uh, if at all possible. Um, some people kind of think, well, you know, we'll have a little survival of the fittest here. <coughs> animals that fit our situation will be animals that get down and, and get it done and made there in a long term that'll work. But in the short term, you got a bill to pay. You got a bank note coming due in January, and you're gonna have to pay the bills. And the only thing, only way you're gonna pay that bill is with a calf. Um, if you're gonna intervene again, you know, if you see that cow and she's she just gets tired, you know, and you see her quit trying for 15 or 20 minutes, if you look at the calf and the, the tongue is really swollen, the head is kind of out of whack and everything is really just kind of going crazy there. Go ahead and get it out. And again, if you see anything that looks like a malpresentation and that's a whole lecture in and of itself, go ahead and get that doggone thing out of there. Okay. And uh, there, that's what I got. The only other comment I have to make is for you fall calvers. Um, let's make sure we start thinking about getting preg checks done. Um, contact your uh, local veterinarian. Um, or get your cows up and get them blood tested and get, get the, that, the blood analyzed. Um, I spend it. Yeah. I know you guys know, cause most of the time I'm <laughs> on here talking about controlling the calving season, but the way to control the calving season with a preg check and the last USDA survey indicated less than 20% of our producers utilize that tool. Um, and it is among the more, uh, cost-effective tools in the in the uh, in the beef industry, and so I highly recommend you consider getting that preg check done in your fall cows. And there, that's that's what I've got. I'm ready to turn it over. Excellent, appreciate it, Les. All right, uh, next up is Dr. Katie Van Valen, and Katie is uh, one of our is 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 one of our beef specialists out at the Princeton Station as well. And, um, oh, looky there. Uh, so, uh, Katie, I'm going to turn it over to you. And it uh, looks like you're going to tell us a little bit about what's happening at Princeton. 
Yep, I figured I would uh, give a little bit of an update on the station. Uh, I figured by now um, most everybody's probably heard that that we were impacted by the tornadoes back in December uh, pretty heavily. Um, so this is these photos were taken uh, a week or two ago now. Um, we tore down the original uh, research center building uh, that was located on the station. So that first picture there uh, on the left side of the screen was taken at 7 a.m. And that next picture with the pile of rubble was about 11 a.m. So um, a lot of history uh, and a lot of progress is, was made uh, in that building and in those those rooms and in that. And, and now a lot of that that's gone, uh, the physical structures anyways. But uh, as our sign says, we are rebuilding. And so we've begun uh, that process and it'll be it'll be a several year process, um, of course, before we're fully back operational. But uh, we've started uh, getting some fences put back in for the cow herd down there. Uh, we had about nine miles of fence that was either damaged or, or completely destroyed. So uh, a lot of work uh, to be done to get to get all of that fully restored. Um, so in the meantime, a lot of our, our in-person programs that we would normally host at the research center, at least probably for the, the remainder of this year, will will likely be impacted. I know some folks are trying to, to maybe do some field days or that kind of thing later this summer. Um, but keep it so keep your eyes and ears out if you uh, typically attend an event there at Princeton. Uh, we may have some some impacts. Uh, understandably, we we still really don't even have running water, so it's not not exactly a place people want to come spend the, the whole day. So um, with that, um, I will just touch briefly on a couple hot topics kind of following up with what Dr. Lim Cooler and, and what Kevin was talking about earlier. Um, especially for the spring Kevin cows, uh, switching over to a high mag mineral. Um, so high mag mineral helps uh, prevent grass tetany. Um, we're looking for something that's got 12 to 14% magnesium in it. Uh, for that, that high mag mineral, we want to start feeding that about 30 days before calving. Um, but of course we can, um, any time is better than, than, than never. Um, and you continue feeding, you know, through, um, that spring warm up and, and once we've got the, the, the grass up and growing well, um, then we can, and we've got those warm high temperatures in the, in the mid sixties or so we can pull that back off and, and go back to feeding uh, our standard cow calf mineral. Um, I, I know we've talked a lot about high feed prices, you know, already tonight, I think we've all touched on it. Um, and, and one of the things about mineral is, is a good mineral is what I call a cheap insurance program, um, or policy. If we've got a good mineral out there, uh, we can make sure that we don't see these deficiencies. And, and unfortunately, by the time that we see a deficiency, so we know we can tell that there's something going on, whether that means that, that we've got cows that didn't rebreed or we have calves that were born weak. Um, by the time we get to that point, um, it's usually uh, we've got a, a bigger problem going on. Um, and so we've got to make sure that, that we try to prevent that uh, from happening. Um, and then, um, sorry, there was a pop-up on the screen there. Um, and then talking about some of those fall calves, weaning calves, uh, and getting feed out in front of them. Um, you know, when we think about those, those average daily gains over that post weaning period. So Kevin was showing some of those numbers there. That's an average across that whole period. And so if we think about those, those first seven to 10 days post weaning, those calves are, are usually high stress um, and, and we actually see a, a, a negative energy uh, balance. A lot of times in those calves they are not eating a whole lot. There's a lot of stress going on in their life. And so I always, whenever I talk about um, high stress periods of time for, for cattle, I, you know, I like to think about preventing the number of bad days that those calves have. Um, and so uh, when we, try to prevent that the number of bad days that those calves have, then we can turn the, the switch on for them and get them uh, back into a positive energy balance back to, to gaining. Uh, when we talk about, you know, the potential of, of increasing that time from say 45 to 60 days post wean that we hold those calves, that extra 15 days can be really critical because now 
were overcoming that that slump that they might have been in, you know, right at the beginning. And so that really helps us drive that that average, you know, back into the mid twos, the mid to high twos. Because uh, we think about the first week or so, um, you know, they're not they're not going to be gaining much at all. In fact, they're they're probably going to be losing a little weight on us. And so we've got to get that upswing uh, going and really make sure that we can take full advantage of that efficient growth that those calves can experience during that time. Um, but if we don't give them enough good days to do their job for us, if we don't give them all the tools that they need to, to get that growth, then then we're not going to be able to take advantage of it. So um, that's just a, a little bit of my mindset on on when we think about these high stress calves is is making sure that we give them enough time to, to have those good days. All right. Thank you very much, Katie. And actually, I uh, had a question that just came in that I'm going to turn you back on to, if you would. If you were feeding dry distiller's grains and distiller syrup, is there a certain mineral that you should be fed with those supplements? The question was, if we're feeding dry distiller's grains, syrup, is there a, a particular mineral uh, that, that we would want to feed? Um, the short answer to that is that in most situations, uh, what we formulate for a, a typical cow calf or stocker mineral uh, was going to meet those needs. So uh, the IRM team, Dr. Limkuler and I just recently last year updated some of those mineral recommendations. Um, most of the time that's going to get the job done for you. When you get into um, feeding really high um, amounts of, of some of the byproducts like stillage, um, can be pretty high in copper. And so that might be a, a situation where uh, you might look at potentially um, getting a, a mineral mix that's got a little less copper in it um, and, and pulling that, that one back out because we uh, simply just have enough of it supplied. Um, but most of the time, um, our traditional cow-calf mineral that, that meets those IRM specifications is going to get the job done for you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. I guess uh, that leaves me. Um, for, so I'm Dara Bullock. I'm ha housed at Lexington and I'm the genetics guy. So uh, the one thing I wanted to make everybody aware of is, is with the CAPE program, if your county is still doing the CAPE cost share program, uh, this year there's been a few changes. They've been relatively minor this year. Um, the, the first is, is that Charlay's EPDs have been updated. That's the only breed that really had updates to their EPDs because of a change in their evaluation. So if you use Charlay bulls, make sure you pay close attention because those numbers uh, have changed. Um, the other big change that from last year, and it's not a huge change, but is that uh, the, the, the genomics requirement, everybody knows starting last year, bulls have to be genomically tested or have genomically enhanced EPDs, okay? And so I'm having some people that uh, are saying this year, well, we didn't know that was the process. And, and, and I said, well, it was in place last year. But the thing about it is, is if your county last year was using 2020 money, then they could get by without the genomics test. And so since this year, you have to either be using 2022 money or 2021 money, the genomics test is absolutely required. Now, what we have also implemented as an alternative, what was in place last year was that you could, it either had to be have genomically enhanced or you could look and see if the accuracy for calving ease direct uh, was 0.3 or greater, and that would qualify. For this year, that has been lowered to 0.25. So if the calving ease direct EPD on the bull you're considering is 0.25 or above, uh, then it, it will qualify as long as the EPDs also qualify. So just make sure you pay attention to that. Now, I have to, as a, as a disqualifier there, I have to say that this is all pending board approval. The board, the, the full board does not vote on that officially until the 18th of March, uh, but I'm fairly confident that that's going to be the case. So if you're already currently looking for bulls, 
Uh, I think you're going to be safe if that bull is either you have it specifically says he was genomically enhanced EPDs or cavities direct of 0.25 or higher. And so that's kind of my hot topic. So I want to get into make sure we have uh, plenty of questions. We have time to get into some questions. So um, Let's see, we've got a question from Mr. Yoder. Fall calves that are weaned in May and are on mixed grass pasture, what percentage of protein should be in the supplement? Uh, Katie or Jeff, y'all want to jump on that one? Yep. Um, so in that situation, that kind of gets back to, um, I think, what Kevin was talking about earlier, if we we're trying to maybe hold them a little longer uh, and have a little bit more of a, a forage based program with a little less supplement. Um, again, it's all about that at meeting that average uh, requirement. Um, but you know, that might be a situation where we can get away with, with more like a, a 13, 14% kind of feed, uh, versus the, the 16%, uh, if we're in those, those hay based, uh, diets, um, where we're, we're trying to balance out more of a, a protein deficit in those, those hay based, uh, weaning rations. All right, good deal. All right, uh, Les, got a question for you that it came in through email today. Is there a recommended synchronization program to utilize on beef replacement heifers when using bulls with natural service instead of AI? And there's a second part. Uh, if there is, does UK have any percent bred first cycling first cycle utilizing this protocol with natural service. Feed MGA or put a cedar device in for seven days. Here I've got, you know, Tuesday to Monday, which if you count Tuesday, that's seven days. Um, most folks do Monday, Monday, and then turn bulls out on Tuesday. Uh, either way works fine, but the MGA is a feed additive. So you can buy that at Southern States. You can get it at Bergman. You can get most feed mills to um, mix some MGA feed for you. You want a half a milligram per head per day, give them about two foot of bunk space and uh, watch them to make sure they're eating because if they're not eating it, eating it, it's not working. So feed them the MGA for seven days, turn the bowl out and you're going to be fine. A couple of things that I get on that. Number one, you know, I've heard MGA lowers fertility and it does if you feed it longer than, than nine or 10 days or if you feed about twice twice as much as what they should get. So you gotta be a little bit careful there. Um, and then, you know, two, I've heard you're supposed to feed it for 14 days. In this system, with what we're doing with natural service, seven days is fine. Another question I routinely get is, do I have to buy more bulls? And the answer to that also is no. In our original trials where we, you know, we had about 4,000 females in controlled trials, um, bull to cow ratios were used from one to 20 up to one to 40 and no difference where it was observed. So you don't need to use uh, extra bulls. I would caution you though, to make sure that the bulls pass a BSE, that they've had one season's experience and, um, and, and you'll, you'll be in, in pretty good shape that way. The cedar device, if uh, folks aren't familiar with the cedar devices, that's the cedar device here, okay? It's that T-shaped plastic deal, and there's a white powder on the outside of that, that plastic, and that's the actual hormone progesterone. And so you bend those wings up, you stick it in this tube here, okay, you put some lube on it, you go in through the vagina, down to the cervix, push the plunger, the wings catch in the vaginal walls, you pull the tube out, and the body fluid soak up the hormone. And the great thing about the cedar is it gives natural the natural hormone at natural levels and so uh, this this works really really well it's a fantastic tool uh, to use for reproductive management if i had the choice dr bullock i would choose the cedar for seven days before i turn the bull out but if it's you know sometimes folks can't get them up and work them twice over a week and so if that's the case uh seven days of mga will work extremely well uh, for those heifers. Excellent. Thank you, sir. 
All right, another question that came in through email today, uh, since, all, since most all cattle people now feed round bales, has the incidence of mastitis increased in the beef cows? Um, and I think this is all kind of part of it. With the wet springs we have experienced in recent years, even though uh, moving feeders constantly destroying fields, we seem to have bad quarters in several cows. Um, I, I don't know, I, I guess I'll take a stab at it. I don't know that I've heard about a, a great deal more mastitis uh, than in past years. Um, I, I, I'll let, uh, I don't know if, if Jeff or Les want to tackle this one or, as well, or Katie or Kevin, any of you. Um, I, I haven't necessarily been hearing of more incidences of it. Uh, I'll, I'll see if anybody else has any input on that. And then there's a second part of that question that we'll cover after that. I can't say that I've heard of, of any uptick in it. Um, there is some data that was done, of course, with dairy cows, but looking at basically um, housing conditions and amount of mud. So kind of getting back to this, this muddy conditions quite part of the question and whether or not that had an effect on, on mastitis. And I think some of that research is, is hit or miss. Um, in some of the research, they didn't see any difference um, due to, to the cleanliness of the cows, basically, or the, or the mud conditions that they were subjected to. Um, and then I think there was another part of that question about looking at, like, hip height, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. And so... Dr. Bullock so, sent these ahead of time, so I tried to do a little a little searching on it. But um, again, in dairy cows, they've seen where they they do look at at hip height and really hadn't seen much of a difference. That was looking at differences between like a Holstein versus a Holstein Jersey cross, which of course we would expect to have some differences in hip height. And there, they didn't see a a real difference in mastitis. But again, that's that's dairy cows in, in one study, so uh, take that with a, a grain of salt. Well, and, and I think, Katie, for that to probably be a problem is you would have to have some really deep mud uh, if you had teats actually dragging in the mud, which is what I'm assuming that we're getting to. So um, either some really deep mud or some really long teats, I would say. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, I would have a hard time believing that, that I'll put it this way. I don't think that the solution to the problem would be to breed for larger frame cattle to avoid the teats dragging in the mud. Uh, I think we need to handle that in other ways. And, and actually, uh, Dr. Toich, I don't know if you wanted to comment on, on any strategies about maybe round bale feeders and, and what folks might want to do uh, to maybe avoid some of those mud issues. You have any thoughts on that? Well, you know, there's lots of different ways to feed hay during the winter months. And one of the most traditional ways is, is that we, we kind of concentrate feeding in one area, often use ring feeders, and, and that really makes a pretty big mess about this time of year, especially if we get a, a little bit wetter than normal um, winter. You know, other strategies may be to move those hay feeding points around, and that has several benefits. One, it, it helps to, to minimize disturbance on any one area. The second thing it does is that it's getting a better distribution of the nutrients that are in that hay. We don't, we don't often think of hay as a fertilizer source, but every ton of hay has about 40 to 60 pounds of nitrogen, about 15 pounds of phosphorus, and about um, 40, 40 to 60 pounds of potash in it. And if, if we feed them all in one spot, we not only make a, a mess in the uncleanly conditions for the animals, but we're also concentrating those nutrients and not getting the value of those nutrients that are in that hay. So if we can somehow move our hay feeding points around the pasture, feed them in rings or bale feeders or um, unroll them on hillsides, somehow to get to get the disturbance moved around and get the nutrients distributed more evenly in the pastures. And kind of the extreme example of that would be using a technique called bale grazing. And, and we happen to have a video on our KY Forage's uh, YouTube channel from um, a couple of videos from this winter 
Greg Halleck did a, a real nice video on um, field grazing. And then Nick Roy from Adair County, the extension agent in Adair County, did an outstanding presentation at Forges at KCA session on building soil fertility with um, hay feeding. Um, so that's that's kind of my thoughts, um, minimizing mud by moving those hay feeding points around. Dr. Bullock, I think too, we, we forget about, um, you know, it's, it's bacteria that have to get up into the teat canal that cause the problem. And so if you have weak teat um, sphincter muscles and that's gonna lead to mastitis, but um, injuries to the teat, even when we were doing our milk study, we, we had several cows, teats that came in that calves had bitten through and injured. And then that will basically cause uh, a route for bacteria to get up into that teat canal. So the, the mud is certainly an issue that we need to think about. And, and when that cow lays down, regardless of how tall she is, um, that udder is gonna get down in the mud if we don't have a dry spot or, or something to keep it away from the mud. So height is not gonna be the solution to that answer because the udder is still gonna get down and the teats are gonna get down on the ground. And we forget that another source is ponds. Um, if you, if you spend enough time, you'll, you'll watch a calf go to a cow that's standing in a pond and, and go back and try and nurse her, uh, because she won't get out of that pond. And so now you've relaxed that teat canal sphincter and, and that calf is nursing. And as soon as that calf gets done, that teat gets down in the water. And now you've got bacteria in that pond water that can get up in there and cause mastitis as well. So, um, just just remember that it's all routes of contamination for bacteria to, that can get up in there and cause that mastitis. Excellent. All right. Any, anybody else want to jump in on the mastitis bandwagon or are we good to go on that? All right. Uh, Dr. Jackson had, had a question for you. Um, uh, when building a working facility, should I go with a bug box or a tub? The uh, million, you know, the million dollar question. <laughs> well, I think it partially depends on uh, on the cost, producer, uh, disposition of the cattle. But uh, from a cost standpoint, traditionally, bug boxes have been cheaper. It also kind of depends on how much resources you have avail available for purchasing these. Uh, bud boxes have traditionally been a little more cost effective to build and purchase. So with the bud box being about um, 10 to 12 foot wide and about 20 to 40 or uh, 24 to 20 foot long. Um, and so they can also be worked by one producer. And so if you have cattle who can move fairly easily, it can be a very effective system. If you have one person or two people can do it very effectively, to make the system work. Uh, the, Important to consider for the bud box, you know, make sure you have a 20 foot alley so you can keep up a number of animals once you get them worked and, and a good backstop. When you do get those animals into that alley, um, leading to your chute, that you go ahead and shut that once you have them queued up. And uh, just, just think about when you're loading these animals into that bud box, similar to a tub, you only load maybe two or three at a time. And that, that really helps get, uh, achieve a better flow as opposed to trying to push a whole bunch of animals in there well they're just going to stop and circle it's not going to work the way it should so either way um it has to work but i think butt boxes i think a lot of producers throughout the state have been able to utilize them and, and but they work seem to work very effectively if labor is limited and um you know we're trying to be cognizant of our cost of putting in this facility so I'm, i've become a a bigger fan of bud boxes. And it depends on how much space you have. Cause you have to remember, we have to go out to, you have your bud box and you have to go out to 90 degrees to the right or left, about 20, 20 to 40 foot. So it is an important consideration, but I think bud boxes uh, can be uh, a pretty good design. And there are, yeah, there are the newer tub bud, uh, some of the newer bud, bud tub, designs. So if you have a uh, you know, large number of animals that you're working, those can be very effective. However, I think, you know, when we consider the traditional herd size for Kentucky, what cow Kentucky cattlemen a different ones say, if we're looking at the traditional herd, about 20 to 30 cows, you know, we don't need it that resilient of a system or costly of a system. So a lot of times I just recommend, you know, a, 
a simpler bud box. But if we do have a larger number of animals, you have the newer bud tub designs, they look, because you're, you're taking advantage of that, that psychological effect on the cattle with the bud boxes, and you have that where you can also somewhat push them as well. I think that'd be the ideal. What's, you know, at some point, what's functional? I think for a lot of producers across the state, it'd be the traditional bud box. But the bud tub, you know, I would, I would definitely, I'm a huge fan, but just, it's just going to be again, that additional cost. All right. Come on. Cost is anything. We don't need to worry about cost, do we? <laughs> All right. Speaking of cost, another question is uh, my feed dealer is trying to sell me a 13% grower ration instead of a simple commodity mix. Is this a better feed? How about it, nutritionist? Can I jump in here, Jeff? Sure. Can Katie, part me wrong. I'm wrong. In, in general, I think you need to realize, you need to just <laughs> figure out what you're going to yeah, use. We were just in here 20 minutes ago. Are we there? Okay. Uh, I've got some feedback here. Anyway, if you if this is a feed that's going to go into a full feeding situation through a self feeder, uh, you know, I think I think that might be the right the right choice. Uh, what what you the biggest thing is talk to your feed dealer and find out. Don't be afraid to ask questions. If it's a complete ration that's made for a self feeder, it's probably going to have some roughage built in to make that feed safe for a self feeder. If you're going to be hand feeding limited amounts, say uh, grain on grass or some, you know, even up to two percent body weight, you may be better off with a simple commodity mix of an equivalent or higher protein because you get more energy dense feed for every pound you're putting out there. So uh, just, you know, there's no reason if, you, if you're running cattle on grass or if you're running cattle on pretty good hay, there's no reason to bring, to buy that roughage in with the, with the, uh, with the complete ration. Now, again, realize what, is, what are they describing? Is that complete ration also maybe have a mineral pack uh, maybe has an ionophore like rumensin in it. And, and those are all great advantages if you're not feeding uh, an ionophore on the side, you know, or, or, or some other way, uh, delivering an ionophore to the cattle in, in another fashion, say a free choice mineral, whatever. Katie, Jeff, y'all jump in here. The only other thing I'll add is it depends a little bit on what type of animal we're talking about. If we're talking about, for example, Replacement heifers that we don't have to grow at a very fast rate. Uh, they don't need as high of a crude protein uh, ration. It depends a little bit about what our forages are like and uh, the hay test quality. But um, you know that the amount of protein that's going to be needed to totally consume today is also a function of the rate of gain. And so let's don't forget that. Yep. The only thing I was going to add was, you know, it's of course when we're pricing is really, you know, and, and Kevin touched on it when we're pricing, we make sure that we're, um, you know, comparing those to the best of our ability, ask questions about what's included. Um, because certainly if we're just looking at, at the dollars and cents of it, if, if one option has got a, a mineral pack in it, yeah, it's going to cost you more up front. But um, if, if it's a, a good mineral pack that's in there and, and now you don't have to worry about a uh, free choice mineral intake, um, you know, and, and purchasing that mineral supplement on, on top of your feed. Um, sometimes that, that makes those things that look like a, a big difference in, in uh, sticker price, you know, actually even out a little bit uh, more closely together. All right, uh, Dr. Anderson, I've got one for you, and I, I think I know your answer to this one. Uh, I've heard a little about a new shoot side pregnancy test. What have you heard about it? Well, I don't have any more cat comments to make. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a new shoot side. Uh, uh, let me jump on uh, the internet here and Look it up. It's a new shoot side system called the Alerts. Um, it's from IDEX. Let me see if I, is that popping up there? All right. Yep, this you got is it. From PBS. So you, you, you can 
get them, you know, they're about eight bucks a piece. There's 25 in a box. Um, this little cartridge thing down here, can you guys see my pointer? Take a blood sample. Yep. You put, uh, you take this little pipette right here. After you, you put the blood sample on a little EDTA tube, mix it up 10 times, pull out one pipette full, put it in that little tube, that little slot there. It comes with this saline dripper and you put six drops of saline in it. And 15 minutes later, it tells you if they're pregnant or not. Okay. And it's, it's not instant. You know, like if you're doing a, hand palpation or an ultrasound, um, but they're really, really accurate. Uh, we test them a lot. And by the way, Jeff, I got, and Kevin, I, I ordered some for us to use and they came in the day after we needed them. So any, and we can try them on the yaks sometimes, Jeff. Uh, they said they won't work, but we'll try them. But anyway, um, it's not, absolutely instant but if you're working josh you're 15 20 25 cows you know and you got a catch pin coming out of the chute 15 minutes after the last you can start reading them before the last one's done 15 minutes after the last one you got your answers it's 95 percent accurate after 28 days of pregnancy and anybody can do it i mean kevin we taught everybody down there at the thing how to take a blood sample the other day it's it's simple, um, eight bucks, and then you're gonna have to buy the those needles and syringes too. So probably for ten bucks total, you got your answer. Um, yes or no? Of course, doesn't give you a stage, but uh, I've used them on probably twenty five hundred head now, plus or minus. Um, and as long as you don't open the bag early. Open it right before you use it. Storm in, you know, in the, in the house, you know, something like that. So they're not getting really, really cold. You can't, I, I'll tell you, we tried the first day I tried to do it. It was zero degrees. That ain't a good day to do it. Okay. And I should have been smart enough not to be out working cows when it's zero degrees anyway. But, you know, when it, other than, other than that day, they've worked really well. And, um, and I, I would recommend anybody that wants to, to start getting into preg checking to, to check it out. Um, of course, taking the blood sample and send it, sending it to UK or to Dependable Livestock Testing or any of the other commercial labs, also a really good option. Um, but that, that, that alerts thing is, uh, is, is, it's pretty slick now. It's pretty slick. Uh, Derek, got one other comment. A great friend of mine, Kevin Martin, uh, from down near Henderson. Uh, I don't know if Kevin's still on there, on here, but he was on here earlier. He sent an email about the cedar thing with natural service and heifers, and he just got, he did it last year, um, and he he got 100% preg rates, and it looks like they're all going to calve up real tight. And he wanted me to make that comment because it, it really really worked for him. Now Kevin is as good a cattleman as there is. And so understand that we were we were we were playing with uh, playing with a stacked deck on that deal because Kevin's cattle are going to breed one way or the other. But uh, he definitely was happy with it, and um, and so I wanted to share that before I got done. All right, Les, appreciate it. Um, we're getting kind of towards the end of our questions. I've, I've got one more that I'll answer. If you guys think of some others, uh, please type them in your, your in the chat box. Uh, as a reminder, the, the next session is April 12th. Uh, simple tools to improve management decisions. Um, and that's going to be Dr. Katie Van Valen, which you have heard from tonight, and Dr. Les Anderson, which you've heard from tonight. Uh, the also want to point out that if you are trying to get the CAPE educational, uh, we don't send you any certificates. There's nothing like that uh, on our end. What we do is provide you with a CAPE code, which is UK Beef. And so be sure and talk to your county agent. Uh, you need to get the form from your county agent and in the spot where it says the, the speaker signature or whatever, uh, you can put that CAPE code in. Uh, but once again, work through your county agent because they're the ones that have to approve the CAPE educational programs uh, for you. So um, 
The other question that I had, well, well Chris, uh, we had another one that, that was somewhat associated with your with your hay bales. I don't think you answered it uh, when you were answering your other one, and that's kind of um, what do they need to plant in some of those uh, areas that were that get over disturbed? Uh, well, there's there's several different options, and and. Um... For, for more detail, I'll refer you to a uh, publication that we put out a, maybe two years ago on revegetating these highly disturbed areas. Um, you can get it at your local extension office or on the UK uh, extension page. It's a numbered extension publication that's called Repairing uh, Damaged Pastures or something along those lines. So, so there's two, two basic approaches. A lot of times people go in these areas and they'll try to reseed uh, some, some tall fescue and clover this spring. And, and usually that doesn't work so well because we get a lot of summer annual weed pressure in these areas. A, a better option would be to kind of get, after we get the animals off, we'll get these areas leveled out and then come in as soon as the soil temperature gets to around 60 degrees and then see some kind of a, a summer annual grass in there. The most aggressive summer annual grass would be a, a sorghum sedan grass, and it's going to take advantage of the nutrient concentration in these areas. And the other thing it's going to do is have very quick canopy closure. And when you get very quick canopy closure, you're going to exclude weeds. And, and that means uh, weeds like um, spiny amaranth and cockleburr and, and all these summer annual weeds that really like disturbance. Another summer annual option that, that can work fairly well and you can put on probably a little bit earlier would be uh, crabgrass. And crabgrass is a summer annual grass also. It's not quite as vigorous as uh, sorghum sudan grass, so, so you'll tend to have a little bit more weed pressure with crabgrass versus a, uh, a good sorghum sudan grass variety. And then if you want to revegetate these areas, so you go through summer and then you can plant your full season grass in late summer, early fall, um, when the weed pressure tends to be lower. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, the one last question that we, that I will answer that had to do with the genetic side of thing and then uh, we'll close for the night unless somebody has a quick question they want to type in. But um, someone was asking about, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the EPDs and the importance of, of EPDs and all. Well, what about some mothering ability type traits and things like that? Uh, how do we need to pay attention to those? And I guess I'll put it this way. We can, if, if you have the opportunity, um, a lot of times we don't have that opportunity, but if you're buying the bull off the farm and you can go and see who his dam uh, is or, or some of his uh, siblings, some, some of his sisters, half sisters, full sibs, things like that, uh, and look at things like utter quality and, and some aspects of, of mothering ability, I would say it can have some influence and, and, it, and it might help your decision some, but just keep it all in perspective uh, because first of all, for that, for that bull, you're probably not gonna keep more than say 15, maybe 20% of his calves back as replacement heifers. Uh, and so that's not really where you're making your money. And we also don't have a lot of evidence that that you know, good mothering ability of that bull's dam how well it's going to pass on to his daughters as well. So I still think that our best option is to, or is to use the EPDs to try and balance our production that we're getting out of that female, both from her milking ability and the growth and maybe her mature size and some things like that. Um, that that's where we're going to make the, the biggest bang for our buck, I, I think. So no, I'm not saying to ignore the muttering ability of a bull's dam, uh, but, but just keep it in perspective and, and realize it probably has a pretty small impact on that overall purchase. Appreciate you joining us. I uh, look forward to seeing you back here on April 12th and uh, have a good evening and a, and a good, good spring. Take care.